about 10.52, so just short of 11, 10 minutes or so before 11, and Sharon will let us know. I feel certain when we need to be wrapping up, but it sounds like we can go just a little bit longer if there's interest uh, with this discussion. Uh, there are a couple questions that are already on the table I want to put to people. I also want to make sure that John Brunvig, who is the director of our uh, TR Scholars Program, if, you, if you're interested, uh, jump into this conversation. Gary Thomas, you were one of the, um, the faculty talking about the Roosevelt children, so if you have thoughts, uh, make sure you do. And Greg, where are you? Greg, Greg Wynn, uh, who's a, uh, on the executive board of the Theodore Roosevelt Association, but a collector of Roosevelt, and somebody who's done a lot of work on Roosevelt, so um, it's not, we're not exclusive just to, to the people who are up here, but there were a couple of questions that came up um, that uh, Dr. Martin uh, decided would be best left to the, this discussion. One was, uh, about tension in, in the Roosevelt family. That, that, you know, the myth is, of course, that Alice was the rebel and the others less so. And the question was, did any of the other children resist the, the family uh, pattern or the uh, Roosevelt's very strong opinions about family and about what children in the Roosevelt family should do? So does anyone want to weigh in on that other rebellion against the Roosevelt ethos? <laughs> Well, uh, certainly raising the six children, there were moments of uh, pushing and pulling, as one might understand. Um, in terms of full-scale scale rebellion, I think Alice is really far ahead of her, her siblings uh, uh, and resisting them. Uh, but there certainly are little, little moments. And um, I think Archie is the most alienated from the family um, story, and his memoirs are full of grievances and anger at um, you know getting left behind at church when everybody else and being kind of the the, the, the dumb child and so he, he resisted that and I think he also um, moved to the right of his father politically quite a bit um, that was a form of rebellion to be a member of the John Birch Society when his father was basically a liberal Republican um, and at times a bull looser which is even farther left of uh, the Republican party of his time. So those are rebellions of sort. Ethel was not rebellious and kind of kept her father's faith and the family faith um, by saving Sag Hill and being a good good daughter. Um, Kermit, you know, drank himself close to death. So um, that that's not really rebellion, that's more self-destruction. So. Okay. Anyone else just jump in at any point if you have thoughts? Uh, the other question that, that came up was uh, about TR and Edith and about different parenting styles or tensions in the marriage, um, but, I, but it came out of the notion of, of, of the possibility that they had different parenting styles. And I think opinions on Edith vary pretty dramatically. I mean, uh, some people think that Edith was the ideal mother and the ideal mate for Roosevelt. Others believe that she was a very stern and at times cruel parent, um, that she said biting and sarcastic things. Can you all reflect a little bit about the Edith TR relationship and Edith as a parent. Okay, well, with Edith and, and TR, yes, they did have some difference of a, opinion about how to raise children. Um, Edith thought TR was more permissive, that he'd take the kids out for a picnic and bring them back covered with mud, um, and then she'd have to deal with the aftermath with clothes. So I think his kind of uh, sailing in and playing with the kids in raucous ways made it hard for her. When you have six kids, you have to have some sort of order, even if you have servants. And so for her, he was um, a, a permissive, wild parent, and she tried to maintain regular routines in order to run the household. Um, she did express uh, some criticism of um, how harsh he was with Ted, um, and the fact that Ted had these headaches and was really driven by his father, and Edith does express some opinions, at least in my book, I, I give some examples of her wishing that uh, TR hadn't really pushed his sons quite so ruthlessly as, as he did. So I, I, you know, I think generally, no two parents, what, what James said, no two parents are alike uh, in terms of childbearing. I've never known two people who agree about everything. So um, they were, uh, they got, they loved each other, they got along. But Stacy probably has a different opinion here. Um, I do, I, and I, I, I certainly agree that Edith was actually, you know, a sort of tra traditional reversal is, you know, 
she was probably more the disciplinarian than PR was. She's there. Oh, but, but it's not just, yeah, I have to say the whole idea of TR is not there, they're absent. You know, lots of parents travel for business in, in these days now, and I'm not sure that that always cuts down on your effectiveness in, in the household. Um, there, there are stories at Sagamore Hill, not just with his own children, but with his cousin's children, and going on some of these long roaming uh, adventures around days with his cousin's families. Uh, there was one great incident where apparently it was very hot and all the kids were bored. All the parents were sort of sitting around resting after growing. And so TR said, we'll take the kids on a hike. And he tromped off with nine or ten kids. And they all wanted to go swimming. And uh, since it was a mixed group, TR thought it would be improper for them to take off their clothes and go swimming. So he let them go in the water. And they were all, you know, got all their clothes soaking wet. And came marching back, and I guess Edith ruined, the, or, or Alice ruined the book that had been in her pocket and stained her dress red, and all of the cousins and, and Edith were disapproving of this later, and um, Ted confessed, you know, the children came to TR that evening because Edith was going to toast them all with castor oil, you know, because she was worried that they'd be getting sick or chilled. And they tried to get TR to intervene, uh, and he said, sorry guys, you know, I'm lucky I'm not getting dosed with cash. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there was, yeah, you're on your own, dudes. Um, you know, there, there are certainly examples of, of TR being the more indulgent parent. There, there's a, a story, the only time really that he objected that, that we know about. Uh, the children at dinner, the youngest children sat near their mother and the older children sat near their father and as the other child sort of joined the table, everyone moved up a spot. Um, but T.R. overheard a conversation between Edith and Archie when they were going to dinner one night. And Edith was saying basically, no, you were, you were misbehaved today, you were bad, you cannot sit next to me at dinner, you have to sit next to your father. <laughs> and T.R. was upset that somehow sitting next to him was regarded as punishment. <laughs> uh, but, um, so I, I think, Archie once said that, that mother took no prisoners. I think that Edith had a very strong personality and, and she wasn't afraid to express it or sort of act, act in her own defense. So I, I, I think, you know, in terms of discipline or raising, I think she would have had the, the dominant influence anyway. But that would have been her definition of what they should be doing. Pardon me for one minute. All right, she won't let me. <laughs> well, now we want to know. <laughs> okay, she'll let me. <laughs> all right, so first, I would like to um, I would like to congratulate all of you for being here at uh, Brandon Symposium because you are what educators like ourselves call lifelong learners, and it is an amazing and wonderful thing to see all of you here sticking out for the last day, listening to us asking great questions. And so um, the real joy in a symposium like this for me is interacting with you and hearing your questions. And so I just want to say thanks to you and kudos to you. And part of what's exciting about this kind of um, uh, proximity to the, you know, to the scholars is um, that you learn what's behind some of what we do that you wouldn't get normally if only you read our books. So I want to tell you what I thought was very illuminating, a bit of wisdom from Kathleen Dalton, that uh, I heard uh, that she said to me a year ago when we were at, out at Amy Rohn's territory celebrating T.R.'s birthday. And if you've read my book, you know that I kind of have to take Alice's side on Edith because I'm Alice's biographer, and after all, I came to look at T.R through Alice's eyes. In fact, I wrote that first book on TR while I was in the middle working on Alice so that I could better understand TR because I only knew TR from Alice's perspective, which is, you got to admit, kind of a one-dimensional perspective. So I don't have very many good things to say about Edith in my book, at least until Alice is launched and is out of the house when their relationship becomes much closer. Meanwhile, Kathleen Dalton, if you read her extraordinary biography of TR, 
has some tough words for Alice. You know, and she really likes Edith more than you would think I like Edith in my book. So, and, and there are other historians who have, you know, come down on either side of that Edith was great but misunderstood, and she wasn't all that tough, she just had a lot of work, you know, and she always got the kids, and TR, you know, buggered off to wherever. And meanwhile, you know, then, then well, anyway, so here's, here's what Kathleen said. You want to tell them? Because <laughs> I'm going to tell them your story now. Well, we're ready. <laughs> Yeah, it was really eye-opening to me. Okay, so what she said was, look, Stacy, I could sympathize, I could empathize with Edith because I had a teenage daughter when I was writing this book. And my teenage daughter was giving me, not as bad as Alice, but giving me fits. And so my sympathies were, were completely with Edith. She said, meanwhile, you started Alice, I was writing Alice, researching Alice, when, I, when, I, when you were not that far removed from Alice's age, when she was first daughter. So, of course, you are going to take Alice's side on this. And I think that was really, you know, we wouldn't put that in our books, but I think you, <laughs> as lifelong learners, might appreciate this insight into how our books get shaped and how scholars write what they write, even though we look at the same documents. So we can't, you know, there's no things in objective history, right? But I thought that was a really good insight. Wasn't it just a shtick? I mean, he's the youngest guy doing everything he does. Yeah. 
And you can, I was the youngest guy in my department for like 10 years. This is pretty fun being a young guy. You know, this is a very minor thing. <coughs> but uh, he had no attention span apparently either. And that, that seems to be he bumps around quite a bit. I don't mean that he replied, but that's a fairly deep or even shape, of course, it seems like. But, which has certain elements of being a child, I suppose, in it, you know, but more clearly really like being a boy, and what how we describe a boy in that doesn't sound much unlike how a man should be. And you didn't have to act like a child to have some of that joy of being a child. I think in public it's just shit. You know, this is what this is what he is. He's a young guy doing the important thing. But they're not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I there's no way he has a kid forever. I mean come on, that's just that's just crazy talk. Um, one of the things that makes me crazy, Tara never gets hit for being so Taylor is a really smart guy. It's it's not that he has a short attention span. It is that he is literally smart enough to balance five and six things in his head at a time. You know, the, there are there are all sorts of stories from, from his valet or from people who travel with him. TR read probably a book every day. He read two books, or sometimes he always traveled with two or three books, and in a train trip would read all of them. Um, there's a story about Ellen Wister coming to Sagamore Hill and handing T.R. his new book uh, at bedtime. And in the morning, T.R. handed the book back to him, and Worcester said, oh, well, that's for you to read. And I like, hear what you think of it. He said, oh, I did read it. He read it that, you know, in, in, in that evening. And, um, you know, T.R., he didn't have, he had, what, what, what do they call it, endemic memory, not a, a photographic memory. He could literally read and remember things. And, and he could recite passages of books back. I think that's one of the reasons that memorizing poetry was such a pleasure for him, is that he could actually remember it without a whole lot of effort. Um, he was not an eternal child, but he was, you know, I like Stacy's comment about you guys all being lifelong learners. I really think TR is sort of the ultimate lifetime learner. Uh, he's, the thing that has always fascinated me is that he stays interested in new things. He doesn't sort of hit a point in his life where it's like, oh boy, when I was a kid, you know, we did this. So he's interested in the new things. He he reads new poetry. He goes to the Cubism to the Armory show and does a review of Cubism paintings. And he's he's you know quite honest. He says I don't understand it all, but but I like some of it. That he's actually open to some of that. Um, one of my favorite stories about T.R. is in 1917, he went to Florida, to, to Punta Gorda, with a friend of his who had made a fortune and, and then retired to become an amateur ichthyologist. And these two self-described old men went out in rowboats on, Tam on Tampa Bay and they speared manta rays with harpoons. I mean, these guys are nuts. What are you doing out there? Uh, but there, we have this wonderful album of photographs from this, this uh, devilfish hunt. And, I mean, we're talking about guys in rowboats dragging manta rays onto shore that are bigger than the boats are. You know, they're, they're, they're lucky they didn't get killed or at least knocked into the water or something. And, and TR very proudly brought home one of the, the harpoon books that had been bent and hadn't actually, he apparently didn't get his harpoon into the um, ray because the, the it bent. It literally is like a, a C. It, it bent so far. But you know, he's 58 years old. It's two years before his death, and he's still curious enough to go down to Florida and to, to see what his friend is doing firsthand. Um, so yeah, we we never call him child like it's Agnorville. We do usually say he was nuts. <laughs>
the action sort of gets in the way of the contemplation, and you, there are times when you literally wonder when did he read those books a day? If you're, if you're hiking, jumping, killing bears, <laughs> wrestling with the children, um, cleaning up after spitballs in the White House art gallery, then when do you read the book a day? So you know that, that probably is something of an exaggeration about his reading habits, but he does seem to be able to do it when he wants to. But uh, I just want to make one um, kind of complaint against Edmund Morris. I, I like Edmund Morris's first book a lot, and his second book quite a bit, um, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt and, and Theodore Rex, but he, he's a snob about Roosevelt's intellect, and he goes out of his way in his biography to belittle Roosevelt intellectually. It says his books are pavlum, and they're, they're uh, sloppily researched, which sometimes they were, and that he is a, that, that, that he is a, he's a worker of platitudes rather than a serious intellectual. And I, I think that Morris has done damage to Roosevelt's reputation as an intellectual by um, making too great a criticism of his life as a man of letters. What do you think about that, Kevin? Well, I agree with you about what Edmund Morris says about TR as a, as a writer and intellectual. I think TR was uh, extremely bright and was taken very seriously. Uh, he was president of the American Historical Association and uh, wrote important histories. I mean, they, they were celebrations of military might and fighting men, um, and that's definitely gone out of style in terms of uh, what historians think uh, matters, and so he, uh, a lot of historians criticize him. Uh, but he wrote literary criticism, and he wrote all kinds of, I mean, he, 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 he was a broad-ranging, serious intellectual. There's just no question about that. So I, I agree with you. Um, and, uh, well, do you want me to come in on the, uh, yeah. it was about six? Well, uh, just that my only comment about that is I, I certainly agree with what's been said. Uh, but uh, the, I just gave a talk about TR and John Muir and the trip they took together. And one of the things that these two men had in common was a lifelong sense of wonder. And they just, they, bonded about the, uh, the beauty of the giant sequoias. And um, TR had more playfulness in him than John Muir. And so I think the playfulness and the sense of wonder that TR never lost, although he did have some periods of despair and depression later in life especially, um, and periods in his youth where he was kind of lost trying to figure out his direction. So it's not as if he's exuberant every moment of his whole life. But I do think the sense of wonder and the playfulness are, are really um, odd enough for a politician at that time um, and his high energy that that's why people say he was a child. Because he would often say, oh, you know, let's stop this meeting, let's go to Rock Creek Park, and that uh, a lot of politicians wouldn't do that. Um, and, I, you know, um, so I don't think he was childish. My he, last he, chance he to be a boy, but right? he does talk that way. He has a persona of sure. boyish exuberance. He embraces it. I think he could be childlike. You know, when T.R. was at Sagamore Hill, he was there, you know, away from work, and yet people continued to come and want to meet with him, politicians or, or uh, government officials or something. And there are plenty of occasions where he, uh, there was a famous meeting with John, John Burroughs, who was a New York naturalist and brought some members of the legislature to talk to TR about it, the conservation issues. TR met them at the front door and just said, I can't stay inside anymore. It's a beautiful day. Let's go for a walk. And, you know, they discussed their issues, but he dragged them all over Sagamore Hill. You know, he showed them an apple tree that he climbed in the day before, put a baby bird back in the nest, and, and things like that. But, you know, as much as anything, a lot of times, he just had to get out of, out of the house as for you know, because it was vacation, basically. I was just going to comment. Have you read K. Redfield Jameson's book about exuberance? K. Redfield Jameson on exuberance. Yeah, um, she talks about T. R. and I think that's that's that's. Good. Well, I, I mentioned her earlier book in, in the footnotes of uh, my book, which is that I think there's enough evidence to say that as a young man. He may have had um, a sort of mood disorder that's related to elation. Uh, not, you know, uh, people don't understand about mental health, which is that uh, one out of three families have some kind of mental health issue. It's very common, and mood disorders are quite common. So that if you know people who are bipolar or manic or obsessive, if you watch the television program Monk, 
Uh, you know that obsessive compulsive is, um, it's a, he's an extreme case, but um, there are, I'm sure there are people in this room with mood disorders. I just have to tell you that, you know, I have college roommates who've written about obsessive compulsive uh, issues that they have, and it's, it's very, very common. So it doesn't mean that you're crazy, which is, I realize that's not a clinical word that we're using here, uh, but that he, uh, as a young man, he had these rushes of energy and kind of uh, passionate, um, you know, high energy, uh, intense energy uh, times, but he learned to control it. He, and uh, certainly Edith helped him with that, and his friend Henry Cabot Lodge. You gotta keep these moods, these high moods under control. So I, um, I think uh, Kay Jameson's the, the person to read about you know, the variety of moods that people are captured by. Um, and I, I, I think uh, TR got a, a handle on it, so I think he was under control. Kay Redfield Jameson, exuberance, she also wrote Night Falls Fast, which is about suicide and an extraordinary chapter on Mary Lewis. Right uh, now the theme of uh, the playful six-year-old that's nuts, uh, would it be appropriate that uh, everyone have to do at least a short game of point to point on our audience today? Everyone that accuses gets one dose of caviar castor oil. Well, we, we take fish oil now uh, instead okay. of castor oil. riding on the prairie and, and uh, hiking, shooting things. Um, within the family, his, his nicknames were Thee and Tee. Tee is a little boy. Thee, similar to his father. Um, there's a story that, that after his father died, he asked his uh, family to call him Theodore. That, that you know, he did take his father's death very hard and he writes in his diary that he hopes he can do something in his life to honor him. And the first sort of little step he took was to ask to be called Theodore. Uh, but Alice called him Teddy. Alice called him Teddy. And Alice, no, Alice, 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 Alice called him Teddy. Alice, Alice Lee Alice called him Teddy. Alice. And other people calling him Teddy, he did not care for. And a after her death, you know, Edith called him Theodore because she'd known him all, all his life. And you know, she called him Darling also. But um, to, to friends, friends called him TR, or they called him Colonel. They did not call him Teddy. He came to terms with Teddy, and it was so widely used that although he didn't like it, he eventually just shrugged it off. Crowds, yeah. crowds called him Teddy. Crowds all called him Teddy. Teddy. But I mean, within the sort of family or the circle of friends, you could judge where you stood. If you were still calling him Teddy, you were not a close friend. So on any given evening when Edith and T.R. are reading books, will she, will she, Guardian perhaps, will she say Theodore? Yeah. That's the name of a fashion between them? And what would you mean? Edie and Edith? Edie, Edith. Yeah. We don't say Teddy anymore. That drives us crazy. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of points to throw in here. Uh, just to tail that one. Uh, he did sign his name T.R. on occasion. He did use yeah. the, the initials T.R. More often than not, in haste. Uh, he never used them really formally. Um, he did use also Theo Roosevelt Jr. reports until his father died. And that, uh, yes. uh, in fact, he published Summer Birds of the Adirondacks as Theo Roosevelt Jr. Uh, but to the point we're talking about boyhood, boyish qualities, I, I agree with you. Edmund Morris makes much of the boy-ish aspect of T.R.'s personality, but I agree with the panel. Uh, there's, you know, he's far more sophisticated than that. Uh, I think Edmund Morris is right to some degree with T.R.'s literary pursuits. I, I, I agree 100% that he was an academic, he was an intellectual, uh, but some of his writing is just not up to par. Now, he wasn't a hack, but remember, he did write uh, to make money uh, to some degree, so some of his stuff is just not 
uh, as good as perhaps it could be. Other stuff is brilliant. If you look at, read the preface or the introduction, the introduction rather, to a book lover's Holidays in the Open, which was done in 1916, which for one thing is a, is a great title, A Book Lover's Holidays in the Open, which I think is probably one of his best books. But read the introduction to that book, I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, just a, a two pages of just great prose. Um, the, the second thing is, and I think Professor Dalton had a chapter in her book called The Sensitive Plant. Uh, we made much of TR's sort of masculine bravado, uh, but he could also get his feelings hurt. Uh, he was very sensitive in that regard, and I think her, her chapter was titled after a quote that Edith made of him, where she called him a sensitive plant. And I think we see that at times. He was very easily scolded. Uh, Edith was, of course, good at it. Uh, <laughs> Ellen Hugh Group was another good one that uh, could sort of scold him and get away with it, but he was able to get his feelings hurt. We see that in a lot of ways uh, throughout his life, and also with some of the tragedies he dealt with as well, where he put the lid on it and wouldn't deal with it ever again. But, and I think to some degree that's sort of the child of quality that we see. Thank you. Bye. I was just going to ask, why did Theodore give up Junior? I mean, why is Ted Junior and not Ted Roosevelt III? I, I think it's just sort of, a, I don't think it was a conscious decision. I mean, he gave up, Theodore, president, gave up, you know, the Junior when his father died and, and when he sort of became the, the living senior Roosevelt. Uh, Ted just, you know, because there was so much publicity, got identified as, the, as Ted Jr., as Theodore Roosevelt Jr., and that just always stuck with him. Interesting thing about the numbering in the family yeah. is that um, Theodore Roosevelt, the president, um, then sort of erases his father's existence, and he becomes Theodore Roosevelt, the Theodore Roosevelt, and then his son becomes Ted Jr., uh, Ted, uh, TR2, and then Ted's son is TR3, as if there hadn't been a fee. And so that's, that's what's um, so odd, is that when you have a really famous president, you start counting the Theodores from the famous Theodore, not from the... Now there's TR the fourth, and, but it, he, he resets the family line. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's TR five. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering how much uh, any of you think his asthma had to do with this exuberance. Uh, you know, having these near-death experiences makes you take life much more seriously each day, and since those asthma things happened when he was young and a young man, even I think into the legislature, I'm just wondering. The role of his asthma in making him a strenuous advocate and a strenuous man. Um, I think that's entirely plausible that um, that embrace of life and the enjoyment of every day, but it is true that he was also taught by his father. Um, he really told his children. Uh, it is your duty not to whine and to uh, embrace the life that's given to you and to you know, embrace every day and to uh, live life constructively. So it, it was a learned experience, but there's, I'm sure there's probably a psychodynamic thing too. Because you certainly know people who've had near-death experiences. Often, you, they're different. They're different from, from that. You can't survive. There's all kinds of people. I'd like to go back to the desertion or abandonment of his daughter. I don't agree with that at all. That's been brought up several times. Go back to 1880s and what would a father have done? You know, uh, deserting or abandoning his daughter, he would have left her on the sidewalk. And he didn't. He placed her with a sister who was very capable of taking care of that. I'd like to explore that a little more because that, that bothers me when it's deserted or abandoned his daughter. We've heard several people talk about uh, TR and, and his daughter after the death of his first wife and whether that was an abandonment or and entrusting or whatever, but she'd like us to clarify that. Abandonment is the word that I use in my book, but I, I, I did not write and I do not believe that Theodore Roosevelt abandoned his daughter in that traditional sense. That's not at all that I wrote. Um, what I meant was that for Alice, the perception for Alice was that and, and not necessarily when she was a very young girl, but when she was older and could make some sense of this, that Alice had been abandoned by her mother, who died through no fault of her own. Her father abandoned her to, to 
go out west and take care of his own grieving, but left her with the sister, so not abandoned her on the sidewalk. Then her aunt abandoned her when, instead of staying around to help Alice make the, tr the transition to life with Edith and Theodore, she went um, abroad for many good reasons, but she, she wasn't, Auntie Bai wasn't there to help out. And then Alice would face other abandonments in her life later. Nick Longworth abandoned her through women and alcohol and so forth. So I see this abandonment as a kind of a theme that runs through Alice's book, but I hope to high heaven I did not overplay that card. And I never intended to fault Alice Hathaway, Lee Roosevelt, nor to fault Bambi, nor to fault T.R. for <coughs> what Alice may have perceived as abandonment later in her life. And I, you know, I'm a historian, so I, I hope I'm never going to cite a historical context. And while you know, children did get sent on orphan trains out west and so forth, and okay. While I know there was real abandonment in 19th century, early 20th century America, Alice never faced that kind of physical, nor even necessarily that kind of emotional abandonment, because she grew up in, a, in an intact family. And she was a stepchild, but she was a much loved half sister and stepchild. And, you know, I know Edith cared about her. I know Edith loved her. I just know that they were like, they could be like oil and water. So I never intended to say, Okay, and I don't think that I wrote this. I think, did I write that? No. I don't think I wrote that. <laughs> and, and so, so the, the, you know, the shorthand maybe gets translated for me, but, and I did not ever mean from the adult's perspective that they willfully, purposefully um, ignored or abandoned Alice. I was trying to, as a biographer, understand her psyche. And all I can say about this is the only people who've ever made note of the psychology in my book I had two comments from two different people who wrote me letters. And one woman wrote and said, there is too much psychology in this book. It drives me crazy. And the next letter I got, like the next week was, why is there not more of an attempt to understand this woman psychologically? <laughs> Which made me think maybe I hit the right meaning. Sure, how are we doing? Okay, I was going to ask for the privilege of the last question, but well, we should take two more. All right, so we're well, next. Uh, sure. Uh, this is sort of changing the topic a little bit, but I was, I wanted to reflect or hear a little bit about the panel's reflections as we drive up to the Elkhorn Ranch uh, about uh, this, uh, the Dakota Territory and Native American culture, and uh, what T.R.'s perception of Native Americans was, and what he taught his family about the closure of the frontier and Native American culture in general. T.R. on Native American uh, culture. Well, I, uh, as I looked at that wonderful exhibit um, about the uh, Edward Curtis photographs of the uh, TR children, uh, Edward Curtis has been criticized for uh, the way he recorded uh, the kind of the photographs of the lost native uh, natives of the West. But um, TR and Curtis are part of an early 20th century. Um, beginning of uh, a step away from the post-Custer uh, gen really genocidal attitude. And so TR doesn't, ha doesn't have a really great Indian policy, but he has some people he sends out um, as reformers. There's a book by William Hagen about this that yeah. puts him in a uh, somewhat more favorable light than we really understood. But if you read uh, Winning the West or Under Tri Trips of Arrangement, you're not going to get very nice things said about Native Americans. So I, I can honestly say that I, I can't think of anything. I mean, they had Navajo rugs in Sagamore Hill, and there, there's a, a sense that T.R. late in life uh, did go to the Hopi, and you know, he studied and wrote about snake dances and had kind of the glimmering of an anthropological appreciation of Native American culture later in life, but. It wasn't that. It, maybe if he lived longer, that would have been on his agenda. But uh, I, I, I have some mixed feelings about considering him a real friend of the Indian because of his writings. But some people do consider him a reformer of uh, uh, Indian rights. So uh, yeah, William Hagen would be the person to, to yeah. ask. The so. wrote on the six friends of the Indian. Yeah. Well, if I could just add something to that. Even as early as the 1890s, when he was civil service commissioner, he did make a trip through the Indian reservations in the West and published a report that, while not what we would consider by today's standards to be necessarily favorable, did endorse more positive treatment of the Indians on the reservation. In fact, that was actually printed by the Indian Rights Association in Philadelphia that were proponents of Indian uh, uh, 
efforts in the late 90s. He addresses this question in the Rough Riders, too, and says that he likes this Indian and that Indian, but not Indianness very much and not tribalism very much. But in Winning of the West, he makes extremely stark statements about the righteousness of the Indian Wars and the, the sort of Kipling-esque statements about the white man's burden and the necessary righteousness of the triumph of uh, Anglo-American culture over Native Americans. But it's a very complex subject. I mean, there's no easy way to talk about T.R. Indians. And, you know, the, the one really wild thing that he said is often quoted out of context. I want to say that the only good Indian is a dead Indian, but it's true nine times out of ten, and I wouldn't be too sure about the tenth. That's a, kind of, that's a really awful statement, and it's, it is taken way too far out of context because it's a complex uh, subject, and, and he had considerable um, um, intercourse with Native peoples when he was in North Dakota, and writes interestingly about it for that period. It's not, you, you can't brand it easily in any single direction. Well, and like everyone, I think we have to do it the courtesy of, of accepting that TR um, grew intellectually and changed. And so at different points in his life, he will have different aspects, I mean, different thoughts on this. I'm a little kinder, a little less tough on TR and Native Americans in my little book than, than Kathleen is, but she, she's right as well. So I think the other point, too, is, is that TR theoretically tends to be different than TR personally. You know, he has similar uh, issues when you talk about race relations in TR, and and yet um, person to person, he had black friends who came to Sagmoreville and stayed. He employed uh, James Amos as a valet. On his famous point, point marches, he had actually defend, defended James Amos's father, who worked for the, the DC jail system, who supervised the prisoners who were out cutting the grass in Rock Creek Park, and he would stop and talk to him and see how the day was going. And it's actually the father who said, my son's looking for a job, and, and T.R. was like, oh, send him to the White House. You know, I had a terrible job for him. We need a babysitter. Um, <laughs> 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 poor, poor guy starts working for the Roosevelt's trying to control the children. Um, and it's, it's T.R.'s one-to-one -one interactions always show him in better light than, than sort of his theoretical discussions. You know, the, the trips he made as, as president when he did stop in the West at some of the reservations, you know, he's concerned. He sees it as his responsibility as president to, to try to improve a lot of, of this group of citizens' lives. Um, you know, I think he does write later with sort of a melancholy about the passing of the great tribes and, and how the descendants have to learn a new way of life. Um, you know, but he also felt very clearly that they needed to learn a new way of life. So. He was thoroughly it's assimilationist in his, yeah. in his policies. We've got time for one more. You get it. Explain the how the bad blood between FDR and TR started. How did the bad blood between the FDR Hudson line and the TR Long Island line get started, and where is it? There's there's one simple incident in in 1920 when Ted Jr. was running for governor against Al Smith, Franklin Roosevelt has polio. He can't go out and campaign. And somebody asks Eleanor Roosevelt to take his place. And, and she'd done it around the state a couple of times. But she showed up somewhere upstate, uh, and they had made a float. And they had made a float with the big, giant teapot that they had somehow rigged to have little smoke signals coming out of the teapot. Uh, re referencing the teapot dome scandal and, and, and implying that, that Ted had somehow benefited from ripping off the government. And uh, Eleanor, in a real bad choice, decided she was willing to climb up and ride on this float. Mm -hmm. uh, needless to say, the Oyster Bay Roosevelt's were more than just a little offended by that. And that really is, is sort of the, the big split. Talk about a group of people holding a grudge uh, for a long time that they, they did. You know, it, it's interesting because, you know, Franklin was always a Democrat. His, his father had been a Democrat. The family had sort of peacefully coexisted uh, until until that incident. You know, I think in, in 1912, Franklin publicly said that he was supporting TR because he was more of a Democrat than Woodrow Wilson was. So, you know. <laughs> That, yeah, that, that damn float, man. That just